She had long ago decided for herself that she would destroy these scumbags no matter what it cost her, because she would keep kicking their bodies with her legs while they wriggled around begging for help so that she would finally forgive them. But Neris the Beautiful remembers all the suffering, so she will never forgive those who have tormented her for years. She promises herself she will not regret her actions. They will pay with everything they have. They will suffer like in hell where there is no hope of salvation and in terrible agony. In desperation, her abusers will realize the pain they have inflicted on Neris. Neris will manipulate them for her own purposes, as if it were a game of chess, and then discard them as if they were worthless pawns that were used for necessary purposes for her mistress. She's gonna get rid of those bastards like they never existed. She's gonna smash this chessboard and let no one dare call her weak because Neris is tired of suffering all the time and will finally be able to inflict suffering on her abusers. The man tells Neris that it seems revenge is the whole point of her life and there is nothing the girl wants so badly except revenge. Neris looks at the man with the eyes that saw death and says that he is right, and she wants nothing but revenge because they must pay for what they have done. The events take place in the past when Neris was a prisoner. The girl sat in a cold cell and looked at the bars behind which there could be freedom, but the girl never felt this freedom. And now she is locked in this cage with mice and cockroaches. Neris looks down at her swollen leg and realizes that she can't feel it at all, and most likely this leg can't be saved anymore. But Neris tries to calm herself down because Nell has promised that he will rescue her soon, so it's not too long to wait, and Neris should just wait, because the rescue will be soon and the girl tries to calm herself down, to finally wait for him. When Neris hears her cell open, she asks, if it's Nell. Neris turned around to see Valentina, who was her sister who says that Neris is in a terrible state, and she is very happy to see her sister alive. Neris sees her sister and realizes that it is her dress that Neris wore to the gala. Neris looks at her sister and the girl starts to twirl around in Neris' dress and says that this dress suits her sister better than Neris. And the girl can't help but get excited about this beauty. Also, Valentina smiles and says that besides these clothes, she also suits her place as the crown prince's consort and Neris was not worthy of that place. Neris asks. The sister asks why Neris is only thinking about that. She only came here to see Neris end. Neris asks in horror. Her sister says that although Neris is of low birth, she has an eye color that is only passed down in her family and was easy to take advantage of. But Neris is of no use now, so it's time to get rid of her so Neris won't be in the way anymore. Sister says with a terrible grin that isn't this the only end for a dog like Neris who isn't worthy to be called a member of their family. Neris realizes and speaks with her withered lips, which have not felt water for days. Neris says what? Was her sister thinking of killing her from the beginning? Neris asks. Are mother and father of the same opinion? But the sister doesn't explain anything and tells Joseph to grab Neris and not to play with her. Joseph goes into the cage and says that he obeys his mistress. The man grabs Neris, and the girl starts screaming frantically that why Valentina had prepared such a fate for Neris, because she did everything her sister asked her to do. Neris shouts to Joseph to let her in, for she is Mr. Joseph's sister, but the man holds her tightly. Neris tearfully asks her sister. Nell doesn't know what's about to happen. She can't believe she's going to be killed in cold blood. The sister smiles and says that this is the reason why Neris is acting so stupidly. Then the sister lifts the hem of her dress to step on Neris's sore foot and cause the girl incredible pain. Sister says Neris is talking real nonsense and Nell would never interfere with what's going on. Valentina looks at Neris, who is shaking in pain, and says that she will reveal some secrets before she dies so that Neris won't be so bored to death. The man who killed Neris's mother and the one who adopted her and planned the whole thing was Neris's adored Mr. Nell, whom she followed like a dog on a leash. Neris doesn't understand how this is possible because she trusted Nell, and now she realizes that either her sister is deceiving her or it's the bitter truth that just doesn't fit in Neris's head. The sister keeps smiling and says it's the real truth. The girl says that her family's independence from the Empire was made easier thanks to Neris. So as a reward, she will make Neris' death as painless as possible. As painless as possible, so she opens some flask of purple liquid and then asks the guard to hold Neris' face and open her mouth. 
Her sister tells Neris to be nice to her and open her mouth because the last steam train is coming to her now. Neris screams that she doesn't want to die, but her sister pours liquid into Neris's mouth and says that at least before she died, she learned the truth about Nell thanks to her sister, and now she will die peacefully. Isn't it nice to be able to die painlessly? Princess Chimiel was also involved in all of this and Neris is amazed. If Princess Chimiel was also in favor of killing her, her sister says with a smile that Neris has done well and is like a chess piece. Neris realizes that she did everything for her family and for the Empire. Now she's just thrown away and killed. Neris doesn't understand what she did wrong. Was it all because of her lowly origins when all she wanted to do was live? Could it be because of the color of her eyes? Neris realizes that this is unfair, and she curses everyone who has wronged her. The last moment of her life, Neris says that she will take revenge no matter what and let the gods witness her revenge. At the moment when the girl spoke her words, something happened to the time of the universe, and the gods noticed her words, so the matter itself changed, bending under the willpower of the dying man that sincerely gave his word, and the matter gave in to his order to realize the thoughts of the man. And a divine tear was formed that fell on the soul of the girl who had given up on life. Neris felt the touch of God, and a sadness that she had never felt before was born in her heart. The girl felt that her body was healed, and her soul was freed. But in the next moment, the girl reincarnated back into her body. And this time, she saw her mom standing next to her. Mom asks why her little daughter is crying. Is something wrong? And the woman worriedly wiped the tears from Neris' little face. The girl realized that her words had been heard by a higher power, and she had gone back to when she was still a little girl. Now Neris is facing her mom, who's still alive and has a chance to change everything. After a while, mom comes into Neris' room and says, it's time to go, and if her little girl is ready. But when mom saw Neris, she was incredibly surprised, because the girl standing in front of her. It wasn't like her little daughter. It was a daughter, but it was a mood Neris' mom hadn't seen in a long time. Neris wondered why mom was looking at her so strangely, and her mom says that Neris has grown up very quickly. Neris comments on her mother's words and says that she must be upset about leaving today, so she tries to calm herself down. Her mother says she is, but a few days ago, Neris was behaving very differently. The girl didn't hear the end of her mother's sentence and goes to her to hug her. Neris snuggles up to her mother, and her mother says that she thought Neris had been acting strange the last few days. Neris tries to reassure her mom and says that she was probably just nervous about going to the academy, but now everything will be okay and so will her mom. There's no need to worry. Neris remembers her beautiful mom who used to spend carefree fun warm days with her. Neris tells her mom not to worry because this time she will succeed and she will come back to her. Neris promises herself that this time she will succeed and her abusers will eat dirt in front of Neris and she will torture her abusers as they did in her previous life with Neris. The backstory of this world says that 120 years ago, with the support of the key figure Princess Katarina, the noble people of the Empire personally requested the opportunity to gain knowledge. The place where the people decided to gather is Coton. At the center of this, Coton is an academy called Nobel. For lower aristocrats like Neris, education here depends on her family's financial status. But it is a compulsory school where children of the upper aristocracy, including the royal family, must be educated between the ages of 12 and 19. You could say this place is the center of Katina. Although it is only superficially called compulsory education, in reality the children here are no different from hostages. Neris hears some sound and apparently someone has decided to approach her. The woman asks Neris, does she live somewhere nearby and she would like Neris to show her the way? But Neris says she just asked her, and apparently she's a servant, so she doesn't understand. How can you be so rude to a mistress? Neris says she is the daughter of a knight and should be treated with respect. Neris will not tolerate mistreatment, and she has had enough of it in her past life, so now she is ready to fight to dig her way up. At Neris's words, the maid was very surprised and a little frightened, and says that she apologizes to the honored lady. Neris says she is pleased with the maid's behavior, so she lets the woman go. 
A girl laughs from behind the carriage and says that her maid was very rude, so she asks Neris to apologize. It was the mistress who asked the maid to ask for directions. The lady steps off the carriage and asks Neris, Is she really from Elandria? Neris says it makes no difference. Looking into her eyes, she thinks Neris is not just a knight's daughter. The symbol of Elandria, one of the three warriors who long ago defeated the evil dragon and laid the foundation of the empire. The girl says that Neris has the same piercing eyes as this character, so she is special. The descendants of warriors are born with different qualities, but this trait is particularly pronounced. The first emperor, brave Visco, had eyes of a gemstone dark blue color. Honest Elandria had eyes of a purple color. The last beautiful Ferris had gray eyes. However, their direct heirs disappeared over time. The current family of Elandria claimed to be the legitimate descendants of the warrior Elandria, but now there is only a distant relative who inherited his eyes. Subsequently, around 18 years old, when the power of the jeweled eye manifested. Then, Neris was even able to take the place of the crown prince's consort with the help of her outstanding abilities. The lady who approached Neris says that she has not seen many precious eyes, but when she sees them, she realizes that they are really real gems in the eye sockets. The girl enthusiastically tells the heroine that her eyes are the most beautiful eyes that the girl has ever seen. Neris clenches her fists and says that she has nothing to do with Elandria. In her past life, she was happy to belong to the Elandria family because of her eyes. But now Neris is determined not to draw attention to herself, so she tries to lie and not tell the whole truth, saying that she is from the Trude family. She is now disgusted by the mere mention of these people from Elandria. Madame says that even given such facts, she still has precious eyes and Neris does admit that she is a very distant relative of Elandrius. The mistress says she understands and asks, Is Neris a sophomore? But Neris admits that she just got in. Mistress says she thought Neris was a sophomore, but she's glad they'll be studying together. Mistress introduces herself and says her name is Diane and asks Neris's name. Diane introduces herself and extends her hand to shake Mrs. Dane's. Neris realizes that if Dayan is the Dayan of the McKinnon family, then she is the daughter of Count McKinnon, one of the three largest merchants in the empire, which is a very powerful man. That's pretty strange, and Neris doesn't remember them being classmates in a previous life. Neris memorized the faces of all her classmates when she was a sophomore. The butler tells Diane that if she continues to stand, it will overstretch her legs, but Diane sullenly says it's no big deal, and she won't be standing that long. So don't let the butlers worry. But still, Neris sees that Diane McKinnon's legs are really shaking and she's acting strange. I wonder if she's sick. Dine suggests to Neris that she should go with her in the carriage, but the girl replies that there is no need and that Diane should continue on her way. Meanwhile, Neris will make it on her own too. Diane says they don't know the way. Neris will be better off. Dayan offers to make a mutually beneficial deal. When Neris agreed to help Dayan, she thanked Neris for helping her because they had been able to get to the academy so quickly. It was only because of Neris's help. Neris says she's just a little help and asks. The girl puts her hands on her sore feet and says she's fine, but the adults are just worrying too much about her. They keep saying that Diane will have a hard time living and studying at the academy. Neris was thinking, why couldn't she remember this girl? But now she realized what was wrong and that Diane had probably just given up when she'd been at the academy for a while. Neris realizes that it won't be easy for Diane to adjust to life at the academy no matter how young they all are here. To survive, people will do anything to figure out someone else's weaknesses. Aristocrats always try to find some mistakes or vulnerabilities of others in order to use it in their favor because such is the nature of these predators who always know that they are at the top of the food chain. And for this, it is necessary to maintain their status. Neris realizes that while they were chatting in groups, people were raiding each other and creating rankings. In addition, the young aristocrats, in search of prey, were trying to dispel their boredom. Neris recalls her past life when she was forced to be tied to a desk for a girl to stand outside in the open rain. Her abusers stood under umbrellas and laughed quietly at the girl who had been tied up the whole time. They asked if Neris could repent for her words and actions. 
These girls would never pass up an opportunity to humiliate someone to make themselves superior. The girl ordered her partners to drag Neris inside. When Neris was thrown on the floor, they told Neris not to take pity just because she was a little wet. The girls tell Neris that there are rumors that nominate Neris as a candidate for the Crown Prince's consort because of her precious eyes. Another girl asks Neris, does she really think a scum like her is worthy of a place next to the prince? One of the girls began to worry. After all, Neris has a fever and their joke might have gone too far. The other girl says they are right and they need to cool her down a bit. The woman says she has an idea and then pours a cold bucket of floor water over Neris' head. The girls start yelling that it's a disgusting odor and it's perfect for a smelly brute. The girls say that now that they have cooled Neris down a bit, they need Neris to give up her position as crown princess and demand the girl to sign the necessary papers. Neris says she doesn't know anything about it. The villainess walks up to Neris and says Neris is so dumb she has no idea. Why every day they make fun of her. The woman said that Neris was stupid and superficial. She ordered Neris to live like that for the rest of her life and die quietly somewhere unknown. They called Neris names, saying that she was an incompetent who didn't understand anything. Now Neris is in the classroom and with the other students listening attentively to the teacher's instructions, who tells about the reason why the heroes defeated the evil dragon called Kian. And the reason why the Vista Empire became powerful was because of their desire to do exploits and excel in their studies. So the teacher speaks of freshmen who are worthy students of an academy called Nobel. They are imperial subjects of the glorious Vesta Empire. They cannot stay still, and they must move forward with a sense of self-improvement. Neris looked at the girl sitting in front of her with disdain as she recognized her. The lecturer says he hopes the students keep the ideology of the noble academy in their hearts. The man looks at his subjects and smiles that he adores the freshmen. After all, they are very hot. Neris is approached by Diane and asks if they can go together. But the next moment, Diane sees that something bad is happening to Neris. Once she focuses on those memories, they all start popping up one by one. Neris remembered seeing those abusers and how she had been abused in her past life. Neris couldn't help herself, for she was truly horrified by these people who were constantly and day by day systematically trying to destroy her sanity. Neris's soul has now been purified by the gods, but there is still a residue of the past. When Neris sat up for a while to catch her breath, she told Diane that everything was fine and she was just a little nervous about the new surroundings. Diane says Neris doesn't look good, and she's not sure if her friend is okay either. The girls in front started talking to get everyone to pay attention to Prince Abelus and the daughter of the Marquis of Ricciandros. The girls are discussing whether or not Megara wants to be crown princess. It seems the prince has a lady he's dating, but there are rumors in the social circles. Besides, it's not just any lady. And Lady Megara Ricciandros herself. She is a girl from a powerful family and has the necessary qualities for a good wife. Neris, after a while, went outside to get some fresh air. The girl can't believe she got so sick just from watching Megara. Neris needs to pull herself together and come to her senses. When Neris was walking near the fence, a man came up to her and asked her what she was doing here because he thought that no one would be here because the school week had not started yet. So it was strange to see a student here. The man looks pretty cool and asks who the girl is and why she is walking here. Neris realizes that this is a shortcut she often used in her past life, but she can't tell this unknown man about this information. The guy asks. Neris is a lost freshman and Neris says that he's right. She's a freshman, but she's not lost and she knows the guy's name and calls him Sunbei Ren. If Neris isn't mistaken, the guy is using forbidden items that can't be brought into the academy. The guy says that in their time, even toddlers know about such subtleties and tells Neris to forget that the video is here. Let her go. Neris says that if he keeps holding this leaf in his mouth, he'll die eventually, like all addicts. Sionbei Ren wonders how this freshman knows his name since she's only recently arrived at the academy. Neris says she doesn't think that her ex-dad's brother put it there and that he could have gotten the leaves himself. Sunbei Ren dropped his psycho sheet in surprise and asks Neris how she knows all this. Neris knew in her past life that Sunbei Ren had died alone from his addiction to psycho sheets, 
and realized that the man must be struggling with this problem. Sunbei Ren was so surprised that he even dropped his precious leaf and started worrying about catching it. Neris remembers that when she was in her previous life, she couldn't understand what was going on. But now everything is different. The current Pope Omnitus III considered Sunbei Ren the younger brother of the former Pope and Eyesore. Sunbei Ren was in a shaky psychological state after losing his entire family, so it wouldn't be too difficult to rub in his trust. Through a man introduced to Sunbei Ren, he slowly poisoned him with a powerful sedative poison called Psycho Leaf. It must have been because of this that Sunbei Ren died very slowly and painfully in his addiction. Neris tries to tell Sunbei Ren not to trust anyone. Sunbei Ren says that faith is the most important thing for a clergyman. Neris turns to Sunbei Ren and firmly tells him that she's not kidding and that Sunbei Ren doesn't dare to take her word away because he needs to hear the truth that she's trying to explain to him. Sunbei Ren with an angry voice says that how could Neris know anything about his life and now dares to bother him. Neris says that if it was her, she would definitely find and get revenge on anyone who hurt her because the girl wasn't going to just make up for her pain with addiction. Neris walks away and says it would be a shame if Sunbei Ren died of addiction at a young age, so he should definitely quit his addiction. Neris turns around and walks away, leaving a stunned Sunbei Ren behind. Sunbei Ren looks at his leaf and thinks about Neris' words because maybe the girl is right. Now the guy starts to think and ponder, which was Neris' task to make this young and hot guy think a little before continuing his addiction. Sunbei Ren realizes growing up that children teach him how to live and here at Nobel Academy this happens all the time. So there's no need to be surprised because this place is special. Neris now realizes why she came back at this time. This is the turning point of her unhappiness and the starting point of her wrath. Neris promises her abusers that they will pay for her grief. The events take us to a small backstory about the Mena Tribal Corps, which is a place where male students are trained in swordsmanship, magic, and the politics of technology. In the Vuman Trishal Corps, female pupils study general knowledge and theology. This is the division that exists at Nobel Academy. So the Academy divides the classes into two parts. All freshmen take an exam on the first day of enrollment. The class is divided according to subject and test results. All students are evaluated to see where they will go next. In other words, it means that if the grades are good, you have the right to jump up a grade. When people came to see the scores for the exam, they were surprised that some unknown Neris Trude took the first place among all the freshmen. And they were surprised that this unknown lady has such incredible abilities. Now Neris is talking to Dayeen. She says that she wanted to attend Neris's classes, but now she will study in another class because Neris wrote the exams much better than Dayeen. Neris says that the basic lessons are common in the first year, so they will be able to attend them together. Dayan was incredibly happy to hear this news. That's why her eyes sparkled and a smile appeared on her face. Dayan says that Neris knows a lot about this academy and she is amazing. Dayan says that she thinks Neris is an unusual person and special because she is really smart and knows everything. Neris is the smartest person she has ever met and she has a great future because she is truly amazing. She also took first place in her exams. Diane doesn't understand how Neris can stay so calm. If Diane were in Neris's shoes, she would have spread the rumor that she had taken first place in the academy, so she thinks that Neris is more cool than the others because she is also modest. Neris thinks that if Megara ruined the beginning of her life, then Nelution has ruined her whole life, so she doesn't want to hear anything that reminds Neris of him. Another student comes up to the girls and turns to Neris and asks if she knows her because the girl's name is Angard. She reminds them that they used to play together when they were little. Neris looks at Angard with a disparaging look and says she doesn't remember her, that's why. Let Angard go. Angard is a little flustered and scared, saying that they used to play in the woods together a lot and even made ships out of leaves. Neris realizes she knows this girl. Angard was her only friend, and Neris spent her time with her but Angard brought Neris closer to her from Megara, which is why Neris suffered in her past life. Neris can't forget the betrayal of Angard, who was responsible for Neris being noticed by the nasty Megara. Neris says she'll ask her mom about it later sometime and let Angard don't mess with her studies and get out of here. Angard stands there and can't find a place to sit. The girl is a little worried, 
but she decides to ask Neris if she can at least answer the question if Neris remembers who she studied with, because if they are the same place, Neris could introduce Angard to this teacher, and she wants to study a lot like Neris. Neris looks at Angard with a nonchalant look, and realizes that the girl is trying to say that Neris is ranked number one and wants to be as smart as Neris, but the girl says she's just lucky and lets Angard ignore it. Neris asks herself, is Angard going to do the same disgusting thing to her as she did in her past life? Neris continues to look at Angard and says that this answer will be enough for the strange girl. Neris realizes she won't fall for Angard's cheap tricks anymore and lets her look for another girl who will agree to be deceived. Neris will never trust anyone again lest she be betrayed like in her past life. The next moment, Angard sadly says that she understood perfectly and even stuttered a little out of fear. But suddenly, a girl walks up to the company and she was sorry to dry their conversation, but she thinks Neris is being too rude, so she decides to step in to protect Angard. The girl asks Neris why she can't just say who taught her, since Neris got first place. She must not be better than everyone else, and they are on equal footing here. The girl says, did Neris really get first place in the exams just because she was lucky? The people around them start to look at the heated argument, because Leonon is not on a joke angry, and probably she lost her temper because she also wanted to know the name of the talented teacher that was able to teach Neris. Neris says quietly, but as confidently as possible that her family is not rich enough to afford a teacher, and her father died when Neris was young. Besides, now her tuition is paid for by relatives. Neris says that her situation is different from Leon Onberta's. Leonin starts yelling indignantly that Neris really did get first place by luck. Does Neris really want Leonon to believe that because most likely Neris cheated and she cheated everyone? Neris, with a nonchalant face, continues to say that Leonon may believe. Even a village priest can teach the scriptures, and Neris learned them from him. Leonin replies with a smirk that apparently the village priest has not learned Neris' manners, and reveals that Neris has offended Angard. Leonon laughs at Neris and says that since the girl had no teacher, no one taught her etiquette. Neris looks at the annoying Lyonon and wonders if she should be happy that Lyonon is still as nasty as she was in her last life. Lyonon trampled on Neris, sure that everyone would take her side. Neris says that Lyonon, even though she is the daughter of a low-ranking knight, does Leonon think she can be so uncultured? If you think about it, Leonon was trained in the county, and that must be why Leonon is uncomfortable that Neris has better grades than her. Neris says that seeing Leonon's behavior makes her wonder if Leonon has really taken etiquette lessons. Neris realizes that little children always go with the flow. Leonon's face shows a wicked grin, and she asks angrily how dare Neris say such a thing. But Neris is defended by Diane, who covers for her friend. Diane shouts that who would talk because it was Lyonon who was the first to make caustic comments and this whole conversation wouldn't have happened if Lyonon hadn't approached them. Diane taunts Lyonon and asks, does the girl have feelings of inferiority? People around Lyonon start discussing that if you really think about it, Lyonon started the fight for nothing. People start laughing at Lyonon that the girl is just jealous. Neris concludes that the current will not always be on Lyonon's side. A girl turns to the guys and asks what kind of noise they have made here, because soon the lesson will begin and it is necessary to behave as diligently as possible. Megara approaches her and the girl continues to say that Leonon was jealous and acted rudely, so Megara apologizes for her friend that Leonon was so jealous. Megara also says that taking first place considering Neris studied on her own is really awesome, so Neris has the right to brag about her achievement. Megara says this is their first meeting and asks to introduce herself because Megara is very happy to have such a smart girl like Neris in her entourage. Since Neris won first place, Megara is not afraid to share the news that she won second place and hopes that she and Neris will be friends because their knowledge is on the same level. But Neris the Beautiful sees the underbelly of Megar who is a cunning fox that will never let a moment go to bully the weak. Neris once again hears Megar congratulate her on her first place, and also Megar says that apparently the child sponsored by the Elandrians is really special. All around, people can sense the tension between Megara and Neris, and it's as if an aura of conflict is forming between these girls. 
A teacher comes into the room and asks what the students are doing here and why no one is preparing for class. After all, they have a very important topic today. The teacher says that everyone should sit down, and now he will hand out the exam results and timetable because it's their first lesson. Neris tells Megara that next time she should say hello before starting a conversation. Neris smiles her demonic smile of a man who has seen death and says she hopes she can get along with Megara. Megara has no idea what lurks beneath the guise of this girl who has truly managed to excite the gods themselves with her share. In the beginning, the students are divided into good and poor students. The teacher told all the students who had good grades and who had not so good grades. Individual conversations were held to tell the students about their sentence writing skills, as well as their math and other abilities so that everyone knew what they were good at and what they needed to get. The teacher mentioned Megara's name and thanked her for her excellent work. The teacher said that Megara came in second place and in some subjects, she jumped to another course so it is mandatory. Let her check her schedule and attend the compulsory classes in her first year. Megara thanked Lord Sheridan's teacher and was as radiant as the sun. People said that as expected from the Megara family, all children are different from normal people and Megara really is an amazing person. But when teacher Lord Sheridan summoned Neris, the girl got up from her seat and walked past Megara. It's funny to watch Megara at a young age because she's always smiling and pretending to be kind. But now Megara can't hide her real expression because Megara lost to Neris. Lord Sheridan said that Neris jumped a grade higher in all subjects except basic. Neris should check her schedule and not skip classes. Neris took her exam results and thanked her teacher. Really, Neris is curious why Megara hates her so much and why in her past life these girls tormented Neris so much. Though Neris understands the that whatever the reason for the two of them hating each other, it wouldn't hurt to find out the true motives. Because Neris would want to know the reason why she would retaliate violently against these abusers. Nelushin played family with Neris, using it to satisfy his personal ambitions. Nelushin's younger sister Valentina hated Neris out of nowhere sister. Valentina didn't like Neris, for she was the crown princess, and to Prince Abilus, Neris was an out-of-nowhere bride, nothing more than an eyesore. And for Prince Abilus, Neris was nothing more than an eyesore. But the children of the academy had no reason to mock the heroine, especially Megar. Neris realizes that even if she finds out the reason, it won't change anything. As Neris walked past Leonon, she overheard what the girl said about a stuck-up girl who didn't know her place. Neris immediately felt confident and realized what was wrong. The Junior Knight's daughter had gotten higher grades than Leonon and yet had unusual eyes. It's all about envy and inferiority complex of these girls. The reason may seem superficial, but these very unpleasant emotions can drive anyone insane. When Diane approached Neris after class, she asked, Does Neris really not know Angard approached them? Neris continues to lie confidently and says she doesn't remember Angard at all. Diane continues to talk and says that if her friend says so, it is true. Neris asks Diane if she doesn't have to go to class. Diane tells Neris she'll be right there. But it seems like Neris has a class too, just in a different class. Neris says she still has time, so she's going to go look around the school. Diane says she wants to tour the school with Neris and her friend promises that later. They'll definitely tour the building together and Neris can guarantee it. Diane is happy and says that Neris promised and Dayan didn't pull Neris's tongue. The next moment, the maid comes over and says it's time for Dayan to go. The girls say goodbye. When Diane left, Neris said she was grateful to Diane for sticking up for her. So she said she'd be happy to see Diane later. Diane smiles happily at her new friend and says she'd love to see Neris again. With Diane gone, Neris realizes that she must now go to the secret place in the Zachariah Library. In the distant past, Zachariah made a huge contribution to medicine to the Empire. In gratitude for this, the Empire built the Zachariah Library at the Academy in her honor. However, the library has always been a quiet place. It was Neris's favorite place to rest, and her only refuge in the Infernal Academy, where Megara and her gang constantly bullied her. Neris would go to this library and quietly think about what she should do next and what her next course of action would be. When Neris arrived at the library, a sharp sword was pointed at her face, and the man demanded that Neris tell him who she was and how she knew about this place. 
Neris realizes that she should be the one to ask the man about this. Neris has never crossed paths with anyone here in the past. The man looks at Neris and demands that she tell him and answer his questions. It turns out Cledwin was the sole member and heir to the Archduke of the Empire. After graduating from the Academy, Cledwin eliminated all those who opposed his inheritance of the family title. After all, Cledwin was the one who controlled the northern part of the Empire. Abolis and other aristocrats ridiculed Cledwin, calling him a vicious and cruel monster. Neris has had no contact with the man in the past and did not expect to meet Cledwin in the library when the guy pointed his sword at her face. Neris asks Cledwin what kind of interrogation method is this when they first meet. At the same time, poking her sword in her face. Sadiq brazenly replies that Neris should not answer a question with a question because Cledwin asked who she is and how she knows about this place. Neris says she is an incoming student and came to this place to get some rest. Cledwin says that this is not a place where newcomers come, and Neris starts to lie to him. Neris realizes she is telling the truth. The man notices Neris's eyes and says he hasn't heard of anyone with eyes like that in his entire family. Cledwin asks, Is Neris a bastard child? Neris replies that she is not an illegitimate child, just a distant relative. Cledwin asks, is Neris really related to Nelution? And Neris replies while putting her finger on the tip of the sword blade that Cledwin is telling the truth, but in truth, Neris wants nothing to do with this family. Neris asks that Cledwin get that thing out of the girl's face. Cledwin smiles and realizes that this is a brave child not afraid to touch the point of a sword with his bare hands. Cledwin begins to hide his sword and says that Neris is a relative, albeit a distant one, but says he wants nothing to do with the family. Neris demands that Cledwin stop talking about it. Neris calls Cledwin by name and the man wonders if Neris has heard of him. Cledwin approaches an interesting girl and asks what the intrepid freshman girl's name is. Cledwin says it would be fair if he knew Neris's name too. Neris tells Cledwin that she found out his name herself and it would be fair if Sunbei found out his name himself too. Cledwin was a little surprised at the answer and even squeezed his hand which trembled a little. Neris turns around and says that if Cledwin has no further business with her, she will leave. Cledwin says that next time he will call the girl by her name and let the girl not relax because he will find out what the intrepid freshman girl's name is. Neris walks down the corridor, ignoring the people walking beside her. Neris thinks that every time Abelis saw Cledwin, he said that she was too cold-blooded. But for a cold-blooded man, Cledwin's eyes were too alive. Neris doesn't believe Abelis could be wrong. Neris realizes that for a second she lost her temper without realizing it. You can't trust Abelis's judgment, and Cledwin seems like a good man in his own way. Neris even liked the guy. Sunbei Ren walks up to Neris from behind and says that it's that curious freshman and this floor is for high school. Is Neris lost again? Neris turns to Sunbei Ren and says that she's not lost, but that she'll be studying here too, and she's here for Verlaine the Three's diplomatic relations. Sunbei Ren is surprised. Does Neris mean to say that she will listen to these lectures? Among the selected subjects, it's an advanced course, so not many people attend these lectures. The people around him see Sunbei Ren chatting with an unknown girl and discuss that Sunbei Ren was a wreck, but surprisingly, he looks pretty good now. Also, people are wondering who the girl next to Sunbei Ren is. Sunbei Ren says it's really funny. The two of them are going to attend the same lecture together. In addition, Sunbei Ren asks what the mysterious girl's name is and learns that the cheeky freshman is named Neris. Sunbei Ren says that since she's new, she probably doesn't know the way, so she says that Sunbei Ren can lead her. Neris says it's not worth the trouble since she already knows the way. Sunbei Ren says, why does Neris need to go to these lectures, since it's a subject not often chosen by theology students? Sunbei Ren wonders if there's nothing that Neris doesn't know. Sunbei Ren says that his uncle, on his mother's side, lives in Verlaine and knows a lot about that empire, but still not enough, so Sunbei Ren applied to study Verlaine and thinks it would be fun and wants to go to Verlaine sometime. Neris realizes that if it's an uncle. On her mother's side, Sunbei Ren means close aid. Neris realizes that she needs to hint to Sunbei Ren to be careful with her uncle. When Neris enters the classroom, she sees Megara, who is surrounded on all sides by high school boys. 
Megara is surprised that Neris also chose this lecture, and Megara is happy to see her friend here. She says that if she had known that Neris would choose the same discipline, she would have sat next to her, but unfortunately, Megara has already sat next to Marathi. Neris realizes Megar's tactics and her rival decides to pretend. There are two reasons why Neris, a freshman, might have chosen advanced diplomatic relations. The first reason is that Neris is the only one who got better grades in all subjects. And the second reason is because Neris wrote on her exam paper that she wanted to take the diplomatic relations class. Neris is sure that as soon as Megara found out that the heroine had chosen these lectures, she did everything she could to get here with Neris. Megara says there's nothing she can do now, but asks that they sit together next time. Neris says she would be happy to sit next to Megara for the lecture. Neris realizes that Megara has shamelessly come here to prove she's just as good. Neris thinks it looks really pathetic. The guy who was sitting with Megara asks, does she know this girl? And if so, maybe she will share who this friend is because maybe the guy knows her too. But Megara tries to laugh and say that hardly anyone knows her, even though she got first place in the exam. The man says it's the same freshman who won first place, and Megara is surprised that it seems rumors have reached the upperclassmen as well. The man says he'd brag about it here and there if he'd gotten first place when he entered the academy. Sunbei Ren realizes that Megara and her friend are trying to hurt Neris. Neris says that unfortunately she couldn't brag because she doesn't have many friends. Anyway, it's an advanced lecture, so it'd be lonely if she was the only freshman here. So Neris is glad that Megara is here with Neris. Neris tells Megara that she is glad to have a friend here and now Neris won't be so lonely. Sunbei Ren sees. Megara's hand trembled as she heard such a response from Neris and realized that Neris had masterfully closed the mouth of Megara, who was trying to hurt her friend in every way possible. When the teacher came into the room, he told the students that those who study international politics might know him, but he would introduce himself again, and his name was Henri Voltaire, and from today he would be teaching the students the Verlaine language. The teacher hopes that the students have had time to read the sample test that he gave out earlier in Varlecki. The teacher tells the students to try to translate the text according to the context and situation. Neris realizes that Sir Voltaire is a former diplomat, so he asks the question in an appropriate style. Megara raises her hand, and Henry Voltaire tells the girl to start if ready. Megara gets up from her seat and tells that Livingston tried to improve a windmill in Gallia, but failed due to lack of budget and was killed by the locals. People around started applauding the freshman who was so good in this subject. She is a freshman, but she did a great job with such a difficult transfer. Someone said that it was the freshman who took first place in the exams, but another person said that they were wrong because Megara took second place and another student took first place. The teacher listened silently to Megar's translation and with a certain seriousness that might be present in an experienced diplomat asks, did Neris really think this translation was correct? Neris says it's the right answer and at the same time, not quite the right answer. Neris apologizes to Megara, but unfortunately for her, Megara will not be allowed into this lecture next time. People start discussing about Neris's answer because it's not clear what she meant by her words because at the time she said that Megara had translated correctly, but she made a mistake somewhere. One of the students says that Neris is not too proud just because she won first place. The teacher says that Megara is not wrong, but Neris thinks she answered wrong, so she asks Neris to give her answer. At this, the teacher speaks in Verlaine. Neris answers that Livingstone went to the Gauls. He sought to improve relations with the locals, but support from his country was limited. And he was killed for running out of budget. Next thing you know, the guy who was sitting next to Megara stands up and yells that Neris is wrong. But the teacher tries to reprimand the upstart. Henri Voltaire did not expect this answer and says that this answer is completely different from Megar's. Voltaire asks Neris to explain why she interpreted the text that way. Neris agrees with the teacher. Megara realizes she couldn't have made a mistake in the translation but doesn't understand why Neris is so confident in her answer. Neris begins to explain that the Kinzi that Megara translated as a human name in Verlian is pronounced Kanji. This word is used in Verlian diplomacy as a designation for an ambassador. 
In addition, the word windmill also means a continuous flow in a certain range. Neris explains that she interpreted the content of this example as Ambassador Livingston's failure to carry out the policy that got him killed. Megara watches Neris's speech in horror. Henry Voltaire says it's a free translation rather than a literal translation. Neris added too much of her own thoughts. But Neris doesn't give up and says that she said exactly what the teacher expected the students to say because he had said it earlier. Translate the sentence according to the context and circumstances. This Verlaine course is also about diplomacy. Sunbei Ren looks at the all-knowing Neris in delight. Neris says that Sir Voltaire is also a former diplomat, so she thought it all made sense. Henry Voltaire smiles rather smilingly and says that the students thought that they learn the Berlin language here just to know it. To communicate with people from another country, you need to be more competent. If people's goal is to communicate with foreigners, it is better to hire an interpreter and use general knowledge of the language. And now the teacher asks Neris to answer him. Why she is learning the language of another country? Neris says it's all about politics, because to gain an advantage in a diplomatic situation, she must have a lot of knowledge. Neris thinks right. Students learn foreign languages to improve their diplomatic skills. The teacher says that students should always keep this in mind and not take all words literally. Students need to analyze and reflect and try to get to the truth, and not fixate only on superficial information. The teacher shames Magar and says that if the student runs his eyes only on the available data, it will be a fatal failure for the politician. Henry Voltaire says that Neris the Beautiful has learned this lesson, and so she can attend this course. People start discussing that now it's clear why Neris won first place. Before, the students thought Neris was just trying to show off, but it turns out she's really smart. Apparently, she is so good that she got the right to take advanced courses regardless of her class. Henri Voltaire turns to Megara and tells the girl that only those students who can understand his assignment can attend his class. Henri Voltaire asks Megar that the girl was probably only able to attend this lecture on the recommendation of Madame Hoffman. Megara confirmed Henri Voltaire's words, and the teacher says that Megara will take a short language test after class, so must stay for a while, and the teacher will write a reason for being late for the next class, so. Don't let Megara worry. Megara felt that her greatness was offended. But the guy who's been sitting with Megara all this time tells Sir Voltaire what Neris will do then. Won't the teacher give her the test too? Voltaire was displeased with his student and tells the Enum to listen. What the discussion is about. Henri Voltaire says that Neris has just shown her excellent language skills in front of everyone, so she is a strong enough student and does not need to prove her skills. Megara realizes her plight and asks Henri Voltaire, what happens if she can't pass the exam? The teacher says that Megara will then go to a course appropriate to her level. It is important to the academy that each student takes the course according to his knowledge. Henri Voltaire cannot allow another student to give Megara the answer every time he teaches. Megara and her friend realize that they have been exposed and Megara loses her honor. Henri Voltaire says that if one student makes a mistake, another student will repeat it without understanding the meaning of the task. Megara blushed at being shamed and realizing that she shouldn't have relied on this guy. Neris looks victoriously at Megar, who was humiliated by the entire class, and happily realizes that she has now won this round. Rumors began to spread around the university that Megar had been kicked out of the advanced Verlaine language class because of her lack of knowledge. The girls tried to calm Megara down so she wouldn't get discouraged. The girls started to calm Megara down and said that her translation was not so bad, just that the teacher Walter and Neris picked on Megara because of small things. Leonin angrily says that Voltaire's teacher and Neris were the bad ones in this situation. Leonin excuses Megar and says that she was just unlucky with those two. Megara says that if she had been more thoroughly prepared and also educated to the level of a ducal estate, she would have passed the test. Megara admits that it's her fault for not preparing properly. Her friends begin to wonder how Megara can be so modest when it's not even her fault. Leonon says that anyone would have gotten first place if they'd been educated at the duchy. But Diane overhears Neris's abusers talking and says that Neris has already claimed that she never received an education at the duchy. So she asks that the girls not spread false rumors. When Neris moved up a class, Megara was jealous of her and used her connection to join, 
Naturally, she was kicked out for lack of knowledge. Diane doesn't understand why telling obvious lies misleads others. Neris tries to explain to Diane that it's all because of jealousy. Neris doesn't understand why jealousy makes people so bloodthirsty. The reason Megara hated her as a child is because Neris always thought it was her fault, that it was because Neris was weird and not liked by others. Neris truly believed that it was her fault that Megar's friends and Megar herself hurt her. Now when Neris thinks about this attitude of Megara's, she realizes that Megara treated Neris differently than the other children. She is a glorious beauty with rare violet eyes, which are proof that she belongs to a noble family. The same thing happened to Megara. Neris, the daughter of a humble aristocrat who is a distant relative of the Alandria family with rare eyes appeared, who immediately surpassed Megara in estimation, and Megara could not bear the very fact of Neris's existence. Look at it this way, but the beginning and the end of Neris's misfortune were connected with those eyes. The friend looks at Neris and thinks that Neris now looks gloomy and maybe because of the words of these girls. Dain should not have reacted to the abusers. Dayan realizes that the truth lies in Neris' mind, which is different from all the freshmen, and she is neat as well as elegant and more mature than the other ladies. Neris the Beautiful is getting rid from stupid bad sycophants like Lyannon. Diane realizes Neris won't like it if she doesn't act civilized, like Diane just did to her abusers. But Diane was just trying to calm Neris down and show her abusers that they were wrong. As much as Diane wants to get close to Neris, she doesn't even have a chance because they're on different courses. At the next moment, Diane has a brilliant idea because she must somehow get closer to Neris, so they ask Neris to attend the party to which Diane invites her. Diane promises it'll be a lot of fun and nothing scary, if it's just the two of them, but Diane doesn't mind if Neris invites some of her other friends. Neris doesn't understand why Diane's so hot on the idea and why she's so friendly with her. Neris has done nothing for this friendship, but still Neris realizes that it sounds good and she must either accept her offer or reject it. Still, Neris agrees to the proposal and Diane is very excited. Diane says it's very exciting and tells them to have fun together. Neris asks Diane to let go of her hands because it looks very strange. Dayan says they'll have the best party ever, and Dayan will get Neris's friendship no matter what it takes. Neris realizes that Diane is a very strange child, and she's a little embarrassed. Events take us to Natasha, which is the lady of the house of the Duke of Gurun House. Natasha approaches His Majesty Abelis. The girl says that she has brought the answer sheets for the freshman exams as Abelis requested. Abelis says he finally got those results and thanks Natasha for a job well done. Abelis is studying the forms and sees the top-scoring girl named Neris. He decides that this is a very interesting specimen. The man standing next to me says his majesty. What has Abelis found some interesting exam? Abelis turns to the man and says, Does Nelucian really want to look at their new star? Abelis tells Nelucian that he should watch it too and says that that blonde girl that Nelucian's family is paying for got top billing. Abelis was the past husband of Neris and is the crown prince of the Vistu imperial family. Also, Abelis says that for the sake of evidence, he brought up the exams and was outraged saying that the test was not an indication of freshman ability, and how a man from the lowest nobility was able to get the highest score. It was even stated that the problem was that the answers had been leaked or Neris had simply cheated. Nelusiona was surprised. Was this really written by a freshman girl? Nelusiona wondered how only an incoming student could write such content. There is not a single mistake in this girl's text. Not a single mistake. And the sentences are written at the best level. Abelis approaches Nelusiona and says that this answer could have been secretly whispered to the girl by someone. Nelusiona looks threateningly at his majesty, and then sighs peacefully and asks, does Abelis really think that Neluciona gave Neris the tests? Neluciona asks, Would he do such a thing for some relative he's never even met? Abelus starts laughing and says that's exactly what he thought, because as soon as they complained, he immediately checked everything. Abelis even asked the teachers. This girl in particular, Henri Voltaire, and every single one of them confirmed that the girl can keep up with the advanced classes perfectly, Abelis asks. Is this the girl who studied under the teachers of the Neluciona family? But Neluciona says that this is not the case, 
and that they have only recently learned of her existence. Abelis wonders, is she a bastard child of one of the temples? But Nelusiona says that according to the data he has gathered, she is not. The prince smiles and is surprised at the news. Abelis starts laughing villainously and says it looks like it's a real genius, and Nelusiona speaks in the same tone. And the pretty girl who was lucky enough to be born with pretty eyes turns out to be a real genius. Nelusiona realizes that since Neris is so smart, she might be more useful than he thought. Meanwhile, Cledwin was sitting in the library enjoying the silence. The man asks his shadow servant if he was able to handle the investigation. The man says that he missed his master, and Cledwin tells the shadow servant to stop talking nonsense. Cledwin says he's busy and asks that the shadow get to the point quickly, and asks what the results of the investigation are. But suddenly the shadow says that everything is clean and tells about his mother who was expelled from Elandria, and his father was a junior knight and that's all the information he has. Cledwin was surprised at how clean it was. The shadow says that it is unlikely that Neris has anything to do with the Emperor or is a spy. And given that Cledwin has personally encountered Neris, he must have noticed that she is not at all well-trained and weak-muscled. Cledwin says she actually came to this place by accident. It turns out that she came to the place where Cledwin exchanges secret ciphers with his subordinates. When his father, the previous duke, died, the emperor was quietly waiting for the right moment. So Cledwin's suspicions that he might have recruited this child as a spy were closed. But on second thought, Cledwin remembers that Neris's reaction was very strange. The expression on Neris's face was as if she was asking how Cledwin knew about this place. A little 12-year-old girl with a weak body who had never even held a sword before. But her eyes were like the eyes of an adult who had seen death, blood, pain, and screams of terror, as if she had lived through all the hardships of this world. Cledwin realizes that something interesting and exciting is emerging in this boring academy. Events take us to the girls. Parties at Nobel Academy fall into two main categories. The first is the official one organized by the student council party, where everyone is free to attend. And the second one can only be attended by those who receive an invitation. They are organized by the students themselves. This party is more like a social event. Usually, at individually organized parties, children from families of the same status and income exchange invitations. After the party, the kids had harsh comments about whose party was awesome, and whose party was so-so, that's the point of a party. Diane's party was like a pajama party, but the linens and appetizers were top-notch, and also well-trained and polite maids. It was a quality and wonderful party with no flaws. One of the red-haired girls walked up to Diane and thanked her for the wonderful party, because girl doesn't regret accepting. It's an invitation. Diane hugs Neris and thanks her for coming, and if she has any inconvenience, then, don't be shy and tell the maids who will help her. Neris realizes that this is certainly not a bad party, and she feels comfortable here. Neris realizes that this is what is expected of McKinnon County. Diane asks Neris if maybe the girl wants to eat something and cooks a lot of stuff that Neris can't eat in the school cafeteria. Dane says that Neris can just say what she wants and the maids will bring it. Neris says that thanks to Dane, she has already had a nice big meal so she thanks her for her work. Neris actually feels very strange. She hasn't done anything, but somehow Diane treats her well. It's like Diane has become a close friend. The girls are approached by another visitor to their party and thanked for the invitation, and she compliments Neris and Diane on their beautiful hairstyles. Neris thanks Angard. After all, she has nice hair too. Dian looks at Angard incredulously. Angard stood and tried to say something to Neris, but the next moment a guy behind her accidentally dropped a drink right on Angard. Angard felt that a cold drink spilled on her, and everyone in the room wondered what had happened. People gathered around Angard to find out what was going on. The guy started laughing at Angard and pointing his finger at her, telling people to look at the funny Angard. The man began to shame Angard and said she looked like a purple mouse it matched perfectly with her headband. The guys start laughing at Angard and say she is a pathetic wet and purple mouse. Another man says that just looking at Angard made him uncomfortable and dirty. Neris remembers being bullied, and she clearly doesn't like what's going on. 
Neris remembers being called a pathetic laughingstock, stupid and stupid and filthy scum. Neris remembers being told all those horrible words and being called nasty, and the next moment Diane gets up in her seat and as the main thing, at the party saying that's enough. Diane says the man who spilled the cocktail on Angard should apologize to her. On top of everything else, Diane started shaming the guy. He spilled the cocktail on Angard and now he's laughing at her. The guy felt he was wrong, and after all that had happened, Angard demanded of her maid Betty that she help Angard change her clothes. Diane started yelling that the situation was over and let all the people go to their places. Soon the chocolate cake would arrive. So let the people wait and continue to have fun. Neris is still reeling from the shock of her past life traumas visiting her. But the next moment, Diane turns to her friend and says that Neris doesn't look good and Diane is worried about her friend. The girl takes Neris' hand and apologizes because Diane didn't like the previous situation either. And later she'll ask for milk and honey and if you drink it, Neris will get better. Neris realizes that if a person has selfless kindness, it is the person to watch out for. After all, the girl may be one of those who taunted Neris. But there's something Neris didn't take into account in her thinking. Diane says there are also jam and almond chocolate chip cookies, so they'll eat them and they can play cards. Dane asks if Neris would mind playing cards with her. Diane asks for Neris to relax and starts massaging her fingers. Diane is trying to hope that at least one child, that she can hope for at least one child to be on her side. The heroine looks at Diane and asks what this game is, and Diane starts to tell her that it's a card game she recently bought, and it would be fun for the girls to try to play it. Neris continues to ponder, wouldn't it be normal to think she had a friend for a while? Even though Neris had always been lonely before, now she might finally feel protected with someone close to her. Neris had been rummaging through her bag for a while after class, and then she grudgingly began to cringe. Diane notices that Neris is acting strange and asks what happened. Neris says it's okay. Angard comes up to the girls and asks nicely, is there something in Neris's bag that could have caused the girls' displeasure? Diane sees Angard and realizes that she is pretending to be close to Neris and is pissed off by Angard's behavior. Neris asks Angard why she is interested in Neris's bag. While Megara looks at her work, Angard says that she just saw Neris open and close her bag quickly, so she wondered if there was something in there. She wondered what to do. Neris meets Megar's eyes and they have a real visual battle. Neris says that whatever is in that bag is just books and school supplies. Angard changes her face very quickly and gets up real scary. She asks if she's hiding something in her bag. Angard says that there are some strange noises coming from Neris' bag, and Alice asks Neris to let her see what's going on in there. But Neris says she can't, and that a noble lady shouldn't look in other people's bags. But Angard starts laughing and says that Neris is already overdoing it. Angard says they are friends, and there is nothing wrong with that, so he reaches out his greedy hand for Neris' bag. But the next moment, Diane bursts into the conflict and takes Neris' bag before Angard could snatch it. Diane says that Angard has shown enough of her character, and if the owner of the bag said not to look in it. People notice that there is some conflict going on again, and it seems that Angard is trying to look in Neris' bag without her permission. People start shaming Angard for being weird for looking in someone else's bag. People decide that Angard is a very rude girl, and probably just a low aristocrat, so she doesn't know the rules of etiquette. She doesn't seem to have been taught how to behave properly with people. A man walks into class and tells the kids not to forget. It's dance class today, so don't let them be late. Angard leaves and Diane says to Neris that there's some problem with her bag. Neris says they'll deal with it later and has to go now, so she thanks Diane for helping her. Neris realizes that events are repeating themselves, and the same thing happened as in the past. Neris's bag now contains dangerous and poisonous spiders. Neris knows that Megara forced Angard to go and find out what was in that bag because she hoped to find out what was in it. That Neris would start yelling at the whole class about the scary things in her bag. But Neris was much more cunning and didn't let Risa open the bag with Dayan. That Megara wanted to see Neris scared and screaming when she saw the spider, but she'd been through so much in her past life that it seemed like child's play now. If Neris hadn't died such a horrible death, she wouldn't have realized it. Neris hopes that Angard will make a different choice, as long as she is willing to give Angard a chance to suffer a little less than she could. 
Neris puts her hand in her bag and squeezes the spider in it. When the dance lesson starts, the man who was dancing with Neris says that they should switch partners. When Neris ends up with another student, the guy says that Neris Beautiful is dancing, and the girl thanks the guy for the compliment. The student tells Neris to listen to him and asks, Would Neris like to be his partner at the freshman prom next weekend? Neris looks at the man with a cold stare and remembers that it was this guy who was bullying her and saying that Neris was a disgusting freak. The guy was telling Neris not to move and how disgusting it would be if this smelly girl spilled stale milk on herself. The man was telling Neris to go on like this and lower her head so no one would see her shame. The guy was telling everyone to watch Neris twitch with fear just a slight movement and the stale milk would spill over the girl's head. Neris tells the guy she's busy because of an assignment, so she's just stopping by the main event with Diane for a bit. The guy says that, really, on the day of the prom, Neris is going to study, turns out that Neris is very studious. Then the guy suggests Neris to attend the party this weekend because she has invited the whole class. So if Neris doesn't mind, the guy asks Angard to go with him. Neris barely heard the guy and the video of the girl across the hall having her braids unbraided. Neris tells the guy that she apologizes, but she needs to step away for a bit. Neris picks up one of the fallen strips and sees the letter a there. The girl, whose name was Alecto, thanks Neris for the girl's decision to return the ribbon to her. Alecto says that she bought the ribbon for a large sum at the Zodiac, but almost lost it. Neris tells Alecto to be careful not to lose this precious item, or accidentally swap it with someone else. Neris says that since everyone has been wearing similar ribbons lately, it's easy to get mixed up with someone else, so it's hard to find hers if she loses it. Alecto says it's okay, and her ribbon has initials on it, so it'll be hard to confuse. The girl is happy with her idea. In addition, Alecto notices that she must have accidentally stepped on her ribbon, so we'll have to wash it a little later. Neris realizes that everything is happening exactly as she remembers it. At this time, Cream Satin Ribbon is a popular ribbon among the female students at the academy, so almost everyone is wearing it. Usually ribbon, so no one would know if Neris switched with someone. If such a thought comes to someone's mind by chance, it's not unusual. Angard shouts for Diane and Neris to come over to her. Neris thanked Angard for inviting her, and Angard responds by thanking the girls for coming to her party. To top it all off, Angard told them that Leonon and Megara and above the aristocracy so they won't be there, but everyone else has come so they can go through and say hello to them. Neris realizes that this is an old theological faculty building that is now used as a banquet hall, and if you go to a certain place, you can see spiders. Neris asks her friend Diane if she wants something to drink, Neris can get her a drink. But as Neris walked, she saw a beautiful scene of two angry girls being held by maids to keep them from attacking each other. Angard started crying and Alecto took her ribbon. But Alecto says that Angard is not at all ashamed to lie in public. Alecto starts accusing Angard of where she found the ribbon. Alecto asks if she's ashamed or going to a party with a stolen ribbon. Alecto screams that she has the ribbon of that light too. So just have Alecto give her the ribbon. But Alecto says that Angard can't see the letter that symbolizes that this ribbon belongs to Alecto. Neris was finally able to achieve her revenge for Angard. Now it was Neris's turn to plant the spiders in hers, and now they would see how Angard would react to them. In her past life, Neris was accused of stealing gold coins and was very much abused because of it. Angard then took the suitcase away from Neris, and then all the contents fell out of the suitcase and a gold coin fell out. Neris didn't steal the coin, but Angard put it there to accuse the girl. Then Angard accused Neris in front of everyone that the girl was taking advantage of being Angard's girlfriend, and now she was taking someone else's. Angard accused that that's what Neris was taught by her mother, and a filthy beggar who steals. Then Neris was so upset about being wrongfully accused that she didn't think twice. And now that she realizes what's going on, the only person who could have secretly put the gold coins in the bag was the real gold coin thief who is Angard. Events take us three days before the party to a self-service laundromat. Neris welcomed that she decided to visit this place. Angard does not have a maid who does laundry, so she leaves her clothes in the paid laundry. 
Neris tells the maid that she apologizes, but she lost a ribbon here and she's worried because it's the only valuable thing Neris has. The maid showed Neris a ribbon and asked if among the ribbons there was one that belonged to the girl. Neris first decided to steal Angard's ribbon, and two days later in the laundry room at the dormitory the day before Angard's party. Unlike Angard, who has few maids, Electo has a maid who does the laundry. So she uses the common laundry room. Electo's maid started asking where Mrs. Electo's ribbon was, and the girl started looking for it hysterically. The girl couldn't find it and realized the mistress would be furious. Neris was the one who had the opportunity to steal the ribbon. Afterward, Neris tossed Angard's ribbon into the laundry room to make it look like she was here. And naturally, the only one Electo would suspect would be Angard. On the morning of Angard's party, the self-service laundry room was filled with noise. Missing linen. Lady Angard, and there wasn't much time left before the party for the maids to find her. Neris had arranged for the women to find the necessary ribbon. Maid Angard was busy preparing the party alone, so didn't notice the embroidery on the ribbon at all. There was no flaw in Neris's plan. Angard put on Electo's ribbon, and Electo lost hers. Their meeting culminated in a party. Now the girls were arguing over whose ribbon it was, and the conflict was in full swing. Electo asked their maids to embroider the letter, and then they would see which one was more like the letter on the ribbon. When Electo finds out that Angard did it, she won't leave the girl alone. Electo screamed that she would even get to Angard's father so the girl has no place to run. She screamed that Angard and her father would not be happy. Diane runs up to Neris and asks what's going on here. Neris says with a nonchalant face that she can't imagine. 